Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 288 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the mystery of synesthesia. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. When you see a written word, do you also see colors in your mind? When you hear music, do you see colors and shapes? Is the number five a jerk, while the number six is a kindly old man? For some people, including Jimmy, all of these things are true. Such people are known as synesthetes, and they have a condition known as synesthesia. They grow up assuming that everyone else is like them, and when they discover that they're unusual, they tend to keep their mouth shut about their synesthetic experiences. But now, synesthetes are a subject of serious scientific interest. What is synesthesia? Who has it? And what's responsible for it? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, as I mentioned, you have a personal connection to this topic. I do. My personal connection to this mystery is that I have synesthesia. I'm what's known as a synesthete. In fact, I have several forms of synesthesia. So I'm what's known as a polysynesthete, someone who has multiple forms of the condition. So this is quite a personal mystery for me. I've talked about it briefly. Uh, in public before, including on some episodes of this show. But today I'm going to be talking about it in in more detail than ever before, and I'll be revealing some things that I've never discussed in public. So this episode is quite personal for me. And before we go further, I understand your family has a personal connection to this uh, subject as well. Yeah, my daughter, Isabella, who folks sometimes hear doing some voice work on the episodes of the show, uh, she also has synesthesia and has mentioned, you know, the at times it's caused her to either have trouble sometimes with math or has helped her with math, depending on how she's used it and various other things like that. And in fact, as I was working on the artwork for today's show, uh, as folks will see from from the what, what they see on their screens or on their phones or whatnot, uh, they... The the letters are correspond to uh, the colors as you mentioned, and she and, said, "Oh, and, and and those are my colors, right? The letters, yeah." <laughs> and she said, "Oh, those colors are all wrong. <laughs> they should be these." <laughs> so, uh, very interesting, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to talking about this. Yeah. So, why is synesthesia a mysterious subject? Well, synesthesia is a scientific mystery, and there are two basic reasons. The first one is synesthesia, at least the developed form of it, is not very common. Depending on how you define it, uh, less than 10% of society has synesthesia. It's something that a small percentage of the population regularly experiences, though, and that makes it mysterious. The second reason is that synesthesia is scientifically understudied. It began to be studied in the 19th century with the birth of psychology, but there was a period in the mid-20th century when psychology became heavily influenced by a school of thought known as behaviorism. Behaviorism wanted to look only at observed behaviors without appealing to internal states like thoughts and feelings, but synesthesia has to do with internal states, and so for several decades, synesthesia was simply dismissed and not studied. In fact, some psychologists thought that synesthetes were just making it up or that they were psychotic and that synesthesia might be a sign of drug use or mental illness. That started to change, though, in the 1980s, and today synesthesia is a hot topic in psychology, and a bunch of studies have been done on it and are still being done. But while we've made progress in understanding it, a lot remains unknown, so synesthesia is mysterious for that reason. In the intro, I said that synesthetes grow up assuming other people have the same kind of experiences that they do, and when they learn that they're different from the general population, they tend to keep their mouths shut. Was that true of you? Yes. Um, I've had synesthesia for as long as I can remember, back to early grade school, and I back then I assumed that other people had it too. Um, in fact, I've had some synesthesia-like experiences 
like a grid that we'll talk about later that I assumed other people had until I was well into adulthood. And I only discovered in the last few years that other people don't have them, much to my surprise. But at some point in childhood, I did discover that other aspects of my synesthesia, like associating letters and numbers with colors, were not things everybody did. I don't remember when I learned this, but I do remember deliberately not talking about it. Then, 10 years ago or so, I mentioned the subject on the internet, on my blog, and I did so very tentatively because I wasn't sure how people would react. But now I've learned more about synesthesia and how many people have it and the research that's been done on it. So now I'm comfortable speaking in detail about it. And today I'll be discussing aspects of my experiences as a synesthete that I haven't mentioned before. Let's try to define synesthesia. Where does the word come from and what does it mean? The word comes from two Greek roots. The first is soon, which means with or together. And the second is aesthesis, which means feeling or sensation. So from its Greek roots, synesthesia would mean feeling or sensing two or more things together. It's having joined or coupled sensations. You often hear synesthesia explained as a condition where people combine two or more sensory modalities, like mentally seeing colors when you hear music. That combines the sensory modality of sight, for the colors, with the sensory modality of hearing, for the music. But while this gives people an idea of what synesthesia is, it isn't a technically precise definition, because sometimes there's only a single sensory modality involved. One of the most common forms of synesthesia is known as grapheme color synesthesia, where you associate letters and numbers, which are things that you see, with colors, which are also things that you see. So there isn't more than one sensory modality involved in this type of synesthesia. Is there a better, more precise definition? In his uh, 2018 book, Synesthesia, the neurologist Richard Cytoic Uh, who helped jumpstart research into the condition in the 1980s, says that we could attempt a more comprehensive definition along these lines. Synesthesia is a hereditary condition in which a triggering stimulus evokes the automatic, involuntary, effect-laden, and conscious perception of a sensory or conceptual property that differs from that of the trigger. So there are several things there. Uh, Synesthesia is a hereditary condition, meaning it runs in families, and people who have it have genes that predispose them to having it, though the reverse is not true. Some people have the genes but don't have the condition. Synesthesia involves involves stimuli that trigger a response. The response is automatic and involuntary. It's affect-laden, meaning it has emotional significance. Uh, The response involves a perception. The perception can be sensory or it can be conceptual. But in any event, the perception is different than that of the trigger. Now, that definition is and all that is kind of a mouthful, but we'll get into some examples that will make the concept clearer. As a basic definition, we can just think of synesthesia as a condition where two or more sensations are joined together, so that when you're exposed to one triggering sensation, a second response sensation will also result, likely like having uh, the trigger of sound resulting in a perception of shapes or colors, or having the trigger of seeing a letter or a number resulting in the perception of a color. Let's talk about the history of synesthesia. How far back in history does it go? It undoubtedly goes all the way back through human history, tens of thousands of years at least. Uh, This is apparent from the fact that it has a genetic component and that it applies to a notable percentage of the world's population. If it applied to only a tiny handful of people, just a scattered few here or there, it could be the result of a new mutation. But if a notable percentage of people, like say 4%, have the genes for it, then it isn't new. It's been around for a long time. In fact, synesthesia is prevalent enough that it appears to be performing useful functions for the people that have it. In other words, that there is an evolutionary selection pressure 
that keeps the relevant genes in the human gene pool. Because if it didn't in some way benefit the people that have it, or if it actively harmed them, then the genes should have been eroded away by now due to a lack of selection pressure. Genetically speaking, there is a use it or lose it principle. If your genes don't contribute something, then they're likely to degrade and mutate away over time. If synesthesia has been around throughout human history, how far back do we have records of it? What's the earliest known case of someone being a synesthetic or synesthete? This is debated. Um, now, music has a characteristic that today we call timbre. It's also called tone color or tone quality, and it applies to individual musical notes. Uh, when you, for example, perceive the difference between a middle C that's being played on a piano and a middle C that's being played on a violin, so it's the same note but different instruments, it's the timbre that lets you know which instrument you're listening to. Well, the ancient Greeks called timber chroia, which can also mean color, and Greek philosophers tried to quantify this type of musical color, perhaps indicating that some of them were perceiving music in terms of visual colors. Similarly, Isaac Newton and Wolfgang Goethe uh, explored the idea that musical tones and color tones had common frequencies, and for centuries, there have been musical instruments known as color organs that sought to associate color with the notes that were being played on them. In these examples, we don't have records of people saying explicit things like, I see colors when I hear music, but given all this color language and association of color with music, it does sound very synesthesia-like, so these might be early evidence for synesthetic experiences being recorded, even though they're not explicit. When was the first medically documented case of synesthesia? That took place in 1812. Richard Cytowick writes, It is in the form of an 1812 medical dissertation written in Latin by Georg Tobias Ludwig Sachs. As a polymodal synesthete, Sachs cited examples of his color synesthesia for letters of the alphabet, for tones of the musical scale, for numbers, and for days of the week. And after this, the study of the subject really took off in the 19th century with other early physicians and researchers getting in on the act. Among them was Charles Darwin's cousin, Sir Francis Galton. In 1880, he published a paper in the prestigious journal Nature about what he called visualized numerals. Galton reported, I have many curious cases of color association with the various numerals, but shall only give a very few instances of them, and those incidentally, in the present paper. I shall also abstain at present from speaking of the many different ways in which dates, days of the week, and months of the year are apt to be visualized. And he went on to describe several different forms of number-based synesthesia. His article launched even more interest in the subject, and within three years, he had noticed that synesthesia tended to run in families. But in the, er in the 20th century, scientific interest in synesthesia started to wane with the rise of behaviorism, which peaked between 1920 and 1940. It even became, became a kind of taboo. Richard Cytowick describes the situation in the 1970s. When I took an interest in it following the chance encounter with my synesthetic neighbor, no one in my academic circle had ever heard of synesthesia. Science had lost interest in it decades earlier because it could not explain the phenomenon. The fact that synesthetic pairings were idiosyncratic made it easy for critics to claim that the phenomenon was neither real nor based in the brain. Back in 1979, my colleagues asked what my neighbor Michael Watson's CAT scan showed. Where's the lesion, they asked. No, I said, he doesn't have a hole in his head, a deficit. He has something extra. Stay away, they warned. It's too weird, too new age. Mess with that, and it's going to ruin your career. But Cytowick persisted, and he and other researchers helped re-energize the scientific study of synesthesia, and today, there's a lot of research being done on it. One way of measuring the amount of research being done is by looking at the number of studies being published on synesthesia. Papers on the topic first started appearing in the 1850s, but there were just a few that decade. 
the number grew slightly, and then, after Francis Galton's landmark paper on visualized numbers, there were as many as 20 papers published in the 1890s. But after that, it dropped off, and by the 1950s and 1960s, almost none were being issued. But then, in the 1990s, there there was a major uptick, and then it grew by leaps and bounds, with almost 100 papers being published in the 2000s and 200 papers being published in the 2010s. So we're now living in a golden age of synesthesia research. Let's discuss some examples of synesthesia so that listeners have a better idea of the different forms it can take. You've mentioned music being translated into colors and letters and numbers doing so, but how many forms of synesthesia are there? I've seen different estimates. One is that there are 80 known types of synesthesia, but Cytoic says that there are more than 150 that have been so far described. So there may well be forms that haven't yet been identified, though presumably they would be rarer forms because we should have caught the most common ones. If there are 150 known forms of synesthesia, how do we keep track of them all? In the early days, they'd often give them distinct names. For example, one of the types that we'll talk about is called ordinal linguistic personification. But these days, there's been a somewhat simpler way of classifying them. Basically, every form of synesthesia involves two kinds of things. The first kind are known as triggers or inducers. These are the things that trigger or induce you to have a synesthetic experience. And the second kind are known as concurrents. These are the things that the triggers produce in your experience. For example, in what's classically called ordinal linguistic personification, the trigger is an ordered sequence. That's why it's ordinal, Um, like a series of letters or numbers. And the synesthete perceives them as persons. That's the personification part, so that they have their own personalities. So in this case, the triggers or inducers are the elements of the ordered sequence, like one, two, three, and so on. And being exposed to the triggers, even if it's just thinking about them, causes you to have the synesthetic experience of their personified forms, which are the concurrent experiences that you have when you encounter the trigger. Can you give an example of how that works? Yes. As a child, I had uh, ordinal linguistic personification. It's faded, and I don't experience it today, certainly not robustly. But for me, the number five was a man, and he was a jerk. The number six was an older man, and he was nice, while the number seven was a younger man. Uh, Seven was the son of six, and he was more energetic than his father, who was old, and uh, he was also nice. Seven, was like six, was nice. So five didn't get along with six and seven. In my case, these numbers were the triggers, and the personalities were the concurrent experiences that the triggers produced in my mind. So if I was exposed to the number five, I'd think of the jerk. Incidentally, this is a somewhat rare form of synesthesia. Only about 4.5% of synesthetes have it. And today, ordinal linguistic personification is frequently called by another name to establish a regular naming convention for the different types of synesthesia. It's now common to refer to forms of synesthesia by a pair of descriptors. The first descriptor refers to the trigger or inducer, and the second descriptor refers to the concurrent experience type. So in ordinal linguistic personification, the old name, the inducers are things like letters or numbers. Uh, Letters and numbers are written symbols, which are known as graphemes, and so graphemes are the trigger in this case. And the concurrents the concurrent experiences, are the personifications. So today, ordinal linguistic personification is often called just grapheme personification. You'll still hear a few of the older names in use, uh, but it's easier to use the two-term inducer concurrent names for the different forms of synesthesia and help keep them straight. If ordinal linguistic personification or grapheme personification is a rare form of synesthesia, what's the most common form? The most common form involves language. Richard Cytoic writes, Language is by far the major instigator of synesthetic experience. Graphemes, phonemes, and whole words induce as many as 88% of all synesthetic perceptions. 
So Cytoic names three different aspects of language that together serve as the triggers for almost 90% of synesthetic experiences, graphemes, phonemes, and whole words. What he means by whole words is obvious. Uh, Graphemes, on the other hand, are the smallest written elements in a language, like letters and numbers in languages that use alphabets like English, or the characters that represent syllables in languages that don't use alphabets but instead use syllabaries, where one symbol stands for a whole syllable, like the Cherokee writing system developed by the Native American polymath Sequoia, or the logograms that represent words in languages like Chinese. So that's what graphemes are. Phonemes are the smallest units of spoken language, that is, the sounds that are represented by letters and consonants in English. So together, these linguistic phenomena produce almost 90% of synesthetic experiences. Cytoic continues by describing the sensory impressions, or qualia, that these linguistic things can trigger. Both written graphemes and auditory phonetic forms elicit not only color qualia, but also what appear to be enormously varied surface effects in the ways of textures, shapes, movement, and shimmering. Qualia are the subjective aspects of perception like redness, brightness, or sharpness. Phonemes additionally tend to engender tastes that are likewise layered with temperatures, exquisitely specific textures such as crunchy, soft, soggy, or gritty, and sensations that we normally classify as flavor. The latter includes spicy, sharp, astringent, mild, creamy, ripe, savory, tart, syrupy, stale, robust, rotten, fiery, dry, greasy, tough, fizzy, mellow, watery, smoky, tasteless, rubbery, and more. So depending on the type of synesthesia that you have, it can trigger a response in any of your senses. Synesthesia researcher Dr. Sean Day runs a website called daysyn.com, and it gathers statistics on people's synesthetic experiences. Currently, it has a database of 1,300 individual synesthetes, and according to their statistics, the most common single form of synesthesia is what is known as grapheme color synesthesia, that is, where you associate letters and numbers with colors. According to their data, 61% of synesthetes have this, and I'm one of them. I've had very strong grapheme color synesthesia since childhood. We used my color perceptions of the alphabet in today's episode artwork, and we'll have a link to where you can view my complete synesthetic alphabet and number system, though I have to warn you, the colors are not exactly the right shades. Uh, I used a list of web-safe colors to approximate what I see, though they aren't exactly the right shades, hues, and tints. Um, From the reading I've done, that's actually typical of synesthetes. They often have a lot of difficulty finding exactly the right shade that matches what they see mentally. And some can spend a lot of time obsessing about getting it right, but I wasn't going to go to those links. But I was frustrated by not having the ha- having readily accessible shades that match my perceptions exactly. Do people with this type of synesthesia have a color for every written symbol? Apparently not. Um, I've read that most people with grapheme color synesthesia don't have a color impression for every symbol, or at least not a strong one. But I've got a strong color impression for every letter and number. What I don't have are colors for the punctuation marks, like periods, apostrophes, quotes, and question and exclamation marks. I have read that other people do have colors for those, so that's apparently something that some people have. I don't really think of the punctuation marks in terms of color, but if you asked me what color they are, my first thought would be that they're gray. So I might have a weak color association here that I don't really pay attention to. Let's talk about what your experience of colors with letters and numbers is like. Where do you see the colors? Is it with your physical eyes or in your mind's eye? It's in my mind's eye. I don't physically see the colors, uh, but I do see them mentally when I look at written words and numbers. I also see the colors when I visualize written words and numbers in my mind. Uh, Sometimes the whole letter is filled up with a color, 
or it has the color superimposed over the shape of the letter. Uh, sometimes the color is like a halo that's around a, a letter that's written in black. And sometimes I just get the impression of a color without really determining more precisely how I'm perceiving it. Are the colors you see unique to you, or do other people with this kind of synesthesia see the same ones? The colors people see are unique to them as individuals, but there are some commonalities, colors that different people tend to associate with particular letters and numbers. Cytoic writes, If the colors were equally distributed, then each one would cover about 9% of the alphabet, but they are not equal. Around 40% of the time, a tends to be red, while in about 20% of synesthetic couplings, H and S are green. O and I are often colorless, meaning white or black, as are the letter I and numeral 1. So for about 40% of grapheme color synesthetes, the letter A is the color red, and that's true for me. My A is red. In fact, for me, A, B, C, and D are red, orange, yellow, and a kind of darker yellow that I describe as sort of golden. So it looks like that part of my alphabet is being inspired by the color wheel or color spectrum, since red, orange, and yellow go together in that order on the color wheel or spectrum. On the other hand, uh, Cytoic says that 20% of synesthetes have H and S being green, and neither of those is the case for me. Uh, H is brown for me, and S is red. So I'm with the other 80% of synesthetes on those letters. But I do perceive the letters I and O as white, and I have something similar with their numeric lookalikes 0 and 1. For me, I perceive 0 as clear or white, and I perceive one as white. Do the colors you see repeat across the letters and numbers, or are some of them unique to a single letter or number? Some of them are definitely unique. Um, for example, C, N, and 7 are all yellow for me, but D is a darker golden yellow, and it's the only one like that. J, M, and 4 are all green, but they're different shades of green. M is a dark forest green. J is a bright middle green, and 4 is a seafoam green, or at least the same color as the seafoam green Crayola crayon. P is the only pink letter for me. Q is actually silver. Uh, I've depicted it in the illustration I did as gray, but it's really silver. T is the only black character. 0 is the only character whose color is clear or transparent, though I also can perceive it as white. And I really like three because it's a rich purple and it's the only purple character. And five is weird because it's a kind of greenish, brownish black. Um, I couldn't find anything like that in WebSafe colors, so I represented it as brown. But the color is actually more complex than that and also a jerk. <laughs> if you see these colors mentally when you read a word or number, what happens when you hear them spoken? Do you see colors then? It depends, and this is true of reading as well as listening. Uh, sometimes I'm so engrossed that I don't pay attention to the colors and I'm not really aware of them. Sometimes I'm dimly aware of them, but if I stop and pay attention, they're definitely there. And that's true of spoken words as well as written ones. In their cases, the colors that I see are determined by the letters used to spell the word. For me, and for the majority of synesthetes, the first letter in the word tends to dominate the color of the word overall, with the final letter playing a smaller role and the middle letters playing lesser roles. This corresponds to the way we actually read words in alphabetic languages. We don't actually pay attention to every letter in them the way we do when we're learning to read. Instead, we pay attention to the beginning and the end of the word, and we guess the word that we're looking at based on that, the beginning and the end, and also the context the word appears in. We only stop and pay attention to the middle of the word in cases of confusion where we need to stop and slow down to figure it out. But most of the time, we're really looking at the beginning and the end of the word. And that affects the way synesthetes perceive the color of words. 
for example, for me, the word apple is dominantly red with undertones of blue and brown. If you went through the word apple letter by letter in my synesthesia, it would be red, pink, pink, blue, brown. Since the A is the first character and A is red, the red of the A really dominates my perception of the word. The pinks of the P's are overwhelmed by the red, and I kind of pick up on the blue and brown of the L and the E as an undertone. So for me, apple is dominantly red with undertones of blue and brown. Similarly, my own name, Jimmy Aiken, is dominantly bright green with undertones of red and brown. Letter by letter, Jimmy would be green, white, dark green, dark green, light blue, and Aiken would be red, brown, white, yellow. But the J, the first letter of Jimmy Aiken, so dominates that I perceive the overall name as bright green with undertones of red and brown. Incidentally, having one form of synesthesia also means that you have a 50% chance of having one or more additional forms of synesthesia, so half of all synesthetes are actually polysynesthetes, or people who have more than one form. Let's talk about another kind of synesthesia, one that doesn't involve language. What's an example of a synesthesia that involves something else? One of the most common forms is musical sound to vision synesthesia. In this kind, when you hear music, you also see colors or shapes. And some people have really acute forms of it, like associating specific colors with specific musical notes. So when the person hears a high C being played, they see a specific color like bright yellow. Richard Cytoic writes, About 40% of synesthetes see with their ears meaning the activation of color, shape, and movement by sound. Common triggers include musical qualities, phonemes, speech, and everyday sounds such as dog barks, clattering dishes, or the timbre of voices. Colored hearing is dynamic, something like fireworks. The shapes appear, scintillate, or move, and then fade away to be replaced by a kaleidoscopic montage of colored photisms, or mental images, so long as the stimulus continues. And the description of fireworks is particularly apt here. Music changes so fast that it can be really hard for people with music vision synesthesia to describe what they're seeing in their minds. I mean, imagine watching a fireworks show and trying to narrate it for a blind person. You know, all the abstract, rapidly changing textures and shapes that you're seeing in the sky. There's just so much going on in a fireworks show that it would be really, really hard to narrate that and describe it all in real time. In fact, sometimes you'll see fireworks shows that have musical accompaniment with the fireworks timed to go off at specific points in the music and with the colors and shapes of the fireworks triggering in the darkened night sky. It actually gives non-synesthetes, a non-synesthetic person, a pretty good idea of what people who have music vision synesthesia can experience. Now, I happen to have music vision synesthesia, though mine is not as intense as what some people have. For me, the colors are not the primary thing I see, although I do see some color. Instead, shapes and textures and tones of bright and darkness are primary, kind of like a fireworks show. And it happens especially when I listen to instrumental music, because if there are vocals, I can get distracted by the lyrics and the shapes and textures of the music go into the background and disappear. It also helps if I can't identify the instruments being used, which is common in electronic music, since if I know the instruments that the sound is coming from, I can get mental images of those instruments being played. But I thought I'd try to give our listeners a bit of a sensation of what it's like for me. So I took a slow, a slower instrumental song that starts in a relatively non-complex way, and I'll try to narrate bits of it so that you can get an idea of what my experience is like. The song is called Celestial Soda Pop, and it's by the artist Ray Lynch from his album Deep Breakfast. The song starts with this sound. 
In my mind, this looks like a translucent ball of light bouncing up and down in the lower left-hand corner of a darkened field of vision. The ball is bouncing up and down on a slightly tilted vertical line or axis. But then the pace picks up, the sound seems to double and become syncopated, and I see two fragmented overlapping balls bouncing up and down on the axis in the lower left-hand corner of my field of vision. Now that the rhythm track of the song has been established, a new musical voice enters and gives us the main melodic theme, which I see in the upper right-hand corner of my field of vision as a series of bright flecks moving up and down uh, from right to left, as if they were going up and down a staircase with the music. When the flecks are lower in pitch or lower on the staircase, they're yellowish and they look rounded, kind of like guitar picks. But as they go higher in pitch, they go higher in my field of vision and become whiter and sharper and more regular. There's a key change. The melody repeats, but in a higher key, and the flecks go even higher in the upper right-hand corner of my field of vision. They look more bright, uh, like white sparks moving up and down a staircase. The music also adds some percussion in the form of thumps. These appear in the middle and lower right-hand field of vision for me as diagonal horizontal slashes that appear for just a moment on each thump at different altitudes in the lower right. Now the melody repeats, but with a new instrument. This instrument is lower in tone, and I perceive its notes as a translucent horizontal blobs in the middle of the right-hand field of vision. They're greenish or greenish-yellow in color, and they have holes in them, so they're kind of sort of like sponges, and they do the same kind of staircase motion. There's also a new rhythm track of little clinks that sound like a person clicking their tongue, you know. These seem like little rightward pointing crescents of ice in the upper right hand field of vision, also moving up and down depending on their pitch. The melody repeats in a slightly higher key with the main melody line moving up and down in the field of vision, which is shifted so that what used to be the upper right-hand part of the screen is now where everything is centered. And the major new element is a new musical voice that starts soaring. It sounds almost like a woman's voice, and I see it as a kind of translucent gossamer scarf or handkerchief alternately floating and swirling up and around the center and upper right-hand field of vision among and around the other notes.
Now, we won't go through the whole song that way, but that should give you an idea, and especially viewers of the video version of the podcast, of what I experience, at, you know, at least for me. By the way, I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for doing the animations to my narration of the song. Uh, they aren't exactly what I see in my mind's eye, because that would have taken way too long. And like I said, it's like trying to describe a fireworks show. What I see is really complex. But the animations give you a good overall impression of what it's like for me. One form of synesthesia is known as spatial sequence synesthesia. What is that and what does it involve? Spatial sequence synesthesia involves projecting certain sequences like numbers or calendars into the physical space that surrounds your body. Cytoic explains, Number forms, memory maps, visualized numerals, and calendar forms are some of the names given to sequences that synesthetes perceive as having spatial dimensions. Earlier, we alluded to spatial sequence synesthesia, SSS, as an overarching term for the panoply of spatial configurations that any overlearned sequence can assume. These have been remarked on for over a century, but only recently have we appreciated how common they are. About 10% of the population has them compared to the 4% that has synesthesia in general. So apparently this form of synesthesia is often not recognized as such, and it's more common in the general population than you'd think, with 10% of people having a form of it, compared to the 4% of the population that would normally be recognized as having synesthesia. Now, you might think that people that had numbers in their spatial sequence synesthesia would just see the numbers as a straight line, like you see in math class, but they often don't, you know, not always. In his 1880 paper, Sir Francis Galton published a drawing of a number line that belonged to one of his correspondents, and it isn't straight. It starts on the right with the number 1, and then there's a clockwise swirl of the numbers up to 12, similar to the face of a clock. And then, from 12 to 100, the line generally makes a big, slow, counterclockwise arc to the left. From 100 to 112, there's another clock-like, clockwise arc, and then it starts reversing again. For other people, it's different. Uh, Richard Cytoic published some illustrations from a spatial synesthete named Marty Pike. Uh, she sees months, days, and hours as spiral designs that surround her. Cytoic comments on these drawings. June is topmost, and July to September take up more space than the other months. Brownish November contains a nested serpentine form for the days of that month. Highlighted days such as 7, 13, 16, and 25 to 26 mark appointments, birthdays, and special occasions. These aid her memory. Overlapping three-dimensional spirals mark the hours and minutes of a given day. The X's indicate the positions where she can look from different vantage points. So spatial sequence synesthesia can take different forms for different people. You've mentioned that you have three of the forms of synesthesia we've discussed. In childhood, you had ordinal linguistic personification, where you saw numbers as having personalities. You have strong grapheme color synesthesia, associating letters and numbers with colors. And you have music visual synesthesia, seeing music as changing shapes and textures. Do you have spatial sequence synesthesia? I'm not sure. Uh, I don't have the types of it that we just mentioned, but I do something mentally that is similar. And this is something I've never talked about in public before, so this will be new for listeners. I do have virtual mental environments that surround me. If I want, I can have what you would think of as a kind of mental holodeck where I can generate any visual environment I want around me and use it to perform various functions. This is kind of like Sherlock Holmes's mind palace that you see in the recent BBC TV series Sherlock. In the series, Sherlock uses his mind palace to solve detective problems and also to calm him down, calm himself down on one occasion when he's under extreme stress. I don't use mine to solve intellectual puzzles, but I have used it to calm myself down when I'm under stress. But 
mind palaces aren't usually considered synesthesia, so I haven't considered mine in those terms. However, I do have another environment that I could best describe as a mental augmented reality virtual workspace that surrounds me. It is projected into the space around me, and it does use functions like timelines, but I haven't run across anything exactly like it in my reading on synesthesia, and I wasn't sure whether it would be classified as it or not. So I decided to ask others. One of the things I did was go on Dr. Sean Day's synesthesia list, which is an email list for synesthetes, and here's what I wrote. Greetings. I'm seeking help determining whether a phenomenon I experience is a form of synesthesia, and if so, what it would be called. If it's not synesthesia, it's at least similar to it. Since childhood, I've experienced strong grapheme color synesthesia. I also have chromesthesia, or music visual synesthesia, although it's not as strong. And in childhood, I had ordinal linguistic personification. The phenomenon I'm inquiring about is a mental augmented reality virtual workspace that surrounds me. This workspace has a number of functions, including 1. Slot function. I place ideas on mental slots or shelves in front of me. I often do that when talking and gesturing with my hands. At one point, I'll put an idea in a particular location in front of me and then refer back to that location with my hands when the idea comes up again in the discussion. People have told me that I talk with my hands differently than other people, and I believe this is part of why. 2. Timeline function. I originally perceived time in the workspace as a line proceeding from left to right, presumably based on the flow of text in written English, and I would gesture to parts of the left to right timeline when talking to people as I referred to different periods in time. I've assumed that everyone thinks this way, but now I'm not so sure. A couple of years ago, I decided that I might make it easier for people if I changed the timeline to fit their perspective, so I flipped the timeline on its vertical axis, and I now gesture to the right for the past and the left for the future. Using this new right-to-left timeline is now second nature to me, and hopefully makes it clearer to the people I'm talking to when I'm gesturing to the past and the future. 3. Map Function I can mentally see maps in the workspace in front of me. For example, if I conjure a map of Europe, I will see Rome, Italy right in front of me and Jerusalem, Israel off to the right. Or at least that's the way it used to be. For the benefit of others, I also flipped the map function on its vertical axis, so now I gesture to Rome in the center and Jerusalem off to my left and their right. 4. Grid Function I mentally overlay the world around me with grids, like on holodeck. I especially do this in dance situations, in which I'll see a grid on the floor marked with locations of where I am now and where I need to be next and when, with curved paths connecting these points. These curved paths are fractionalized so I can see where I need to be at what beat of the music. I teach, call, and choreograph several forms of dance. Square, Contra, Morris, English Country, and Community. And when writing choreography or thinking through dances, I also see geometrical shapes in my head representing what the dancers need to do. I originally assumed everybody had this grid function, and when serving as a dance instructor, I would urge students to see the grid and move accordingly. I remember in particular urging one student who had no sense of where he was on the floor to just see the grid, but it never helped him. Eventually, I began to suspect that not everybody had the grid, and I thought perhaps it was something that only dance callers had. So I asked a fellow caller if she had it, and she said no. Then I wondered if it's something choreographers had, so I asked a world-famous choreographer I know if she has it, and she also said no, which was very surprising to me. I'm not sure how one would write choreography without being able to visualize the dancer's paths on the floor. The four functions above, slot, timeline, map, and grid, are the most commonly used functions and the ones I've been able to identify, though there may be other less commonly used ones that I haven't identified and verbalized yet.
Eventually, I realized that this augmented reality workspace may be related to synesthesia or be a form of it, and I started researching. But so far, I haven't found anything that fits it. Spatial sequence synesthesia seems to come closest. Also, for what it's worth, I remember taking a standardized test in junior high or high school that placed me in the 99th percentile of spatial relations, which I gather has nothing to do with interstellar diplomacy, but instead with the ability to mentally manipulate 3D shapes. I assume that's related to the way my workspace functions. Together, the virtual workspace and grapheme color synesthesia are the two most prominent elements of my synesthesia-like experiences with chromesthesia, or music visual synesthesia, and ordinal linguistic personification playing lesser roles. I'd very much appreciate any insight anyone might be able to help provide on this experience, especially if there's a name for it. Thanks very much, Jimmy Aiken. And you can see elements of what I'm talking about in the email if you go back and watch older videos of me and compare them to newer ones. Before a few years ago, I was using the timeline function in the ordinary way, proceeding from left to right, the same direction that we read English. So the 19th century would be on my left, the 20th century would be in the middle, and the 21st century would be on my right. But then I thought it would be a little easier for other people if I flipped the timeline on its vertical axis to fit their perspective. So now when I'm talking to others, the 19th century is on my right, the 20th century is in the middle, and the 21st century is on my left. So it gives them their own left to right flow, hopefully making it easier for them to visualize the times I'm talking about. Similarly, several years ago, if I conjured a map of Europe, I would see London in my upper left, Rome lower and in the middle, and Jerusalem in my lower right. But to make it easier for others, I also flipped the map function on its vertical axis. So now London is in my upper right, Rome is in the middle, and Jerusalem in my lower left, so that these appear in the correct places for other people from their perspectives. What response did you get from the people on the synesthesia list? Quite a bit. Uh, lots of people said that they were doing similar things. In particular, I was struck by several people noting that they also used what I'm calling the slot function. Uh, they had their own names for it, but they also said that they'd place ideas in front of them in space and time and then refer back to those locations when the concept came up again. For example, if I'm talking about physics, I might put gravity at one point and electromagnetics at another point. And then when I come back to these concepts, I'll refer to the same places when I mention gravity and when I mention electromagnetism. And although the slot function is one of the lesser applications of my virtual workspace, to me, uh, quite a number of synesthetes report doing the same thing. What about the question of whether your virtual workspace is itself a form of synesthesia? Did you get a clear answer on that? No, there was no consensus on this. Uh, many people said, hey, I do that too, but didn't comment on whether it should be considered a form of synesthesia. A few suggested that it was a form of spatial sequence synesthesia, and a few suggested that it was not synesthesia but a different form of visualization. Part of the problem deals with the definition of synesthesia. Uh, typically, synesthesia is defined as involving certain in triggers or inducers, like letters or numbers, that are then automatically associated with concurrent experiences like colors. But it isn't clear that my virtual workspace does that. Instead of me encountering triggers in the environment and having the workspace turn on vo involuntarily, it's more like I trigger the workspace myself and make it do what I want. But how different is that really? Uh, I can just think of the letter Q and have the impression of the color silver, or think of J and have the impression of bright green. In those cases, I would be self-triggering the concurrent with an interior mental trigger. And synesthetes regularly use interior mental triggers, or so I gather, like in cases of spatial sequence synesthesia. If someone's thinking about the 3rd of March, they're going to see it in their spatial sequence around their body. Um, they don't have to see it on a physical calendar. They can just trigger the spatial sequence synesthesia just by thinking about something. So why couldn't I be 
similarly using internal triggers to call up the function of the workspace that I want to use. Since the workspace uses concepts as triggers, it might be considered a form of concept spatial synesthesia. So to me, it's ambiguous whether my virtual workspace should be considered concept spatial synesthesia or simply a synesthesia-like experience. And it might require some additional research and even brain scanning to finally settle the question. Of course, there are lots of other types of synesthesia, and we've only covered a few of them here, so I'd recommend Richard Saitoic's book, Synesthesia, to people who'd like a more thorough overview, as well as recommending Sean Day's daysyn.com website. All right, and before we move on to the rest of the show, I want to stop here and take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Sarah R., Joshua G., Emily R., Kevin C., and Betsy S. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by DeliverContacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. And by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about synesthesia? The first thing we should look at is whether synesthesia is a real thing, then how common it is, what causes it, why it exists, and what relationship it may have to psychic functioning. So what can we say about synesthesia from the faith perspective? Is there anything to cover here? Not really. The Christian faith doesn't have anything to say about synesthesia one way or another. It's not mentioned in Scripture, in the Church Fathers, or in any magisterial document so far as I know. It's too recently classified as a neurological condition for anything like that, especially since it's typically a non-pathological condition that doesn't do any harm to the people that have it. It may actually help them, as we'll see. From the faith perspective, synesthesia is just an uncommon facet of the human experience, and it's up to science to study it. Okay, then. So what can we say about synesthesia from the reason perspective? You said that the first question we should consider is whether it's a real thing. What do you mean by that? During the period when behaviorism was in its heyday in psychology, many were very dismissive of synesthesia. Some claimed that it was just a superficial memory phenomenon, like maybe when you were a child, you played with colored blocks, you know, alphabet blocks, or with colored refrigerator magnets. And so you memorize the colors on your blocks and on your magnets. And then in adulthood, you remember those colors being associated with the letters, but there's nothing deeper than that going on. It's just a trick of the memory. Or maybe people are just imagining the colors in connection with letters and numbers, but they aren't deeply rooted and don't appear in your mind automatically. So you have to do conscious mental work to conjure up the colors. Then there were people who said this was a real phenomenon, but a pathological one that indicated something was wrong with the person, that it was caused by mental illness as a form of hallucination, or it was caused by brain lesions or drug abuse. Then let's talk about those. Let's look at the pathological theories of synesthesia first. What's the evidence concerning whether it's a sign that something is wrong? There really isn't any, at least in the case of the large majority of synesthetes. Uh, Modern studies divide people having synesthetic experiences into three kinds, developmental synesthesia, acquired synesthesia, and drug-induced synesthesia. Developmental synesthetes are people who just grow up with it from childhood. Synesthesia is just a part of their childhood development, and I fall into that category. But some people acquire synesthesia due to other things, including states of sensory deprivation, meditation, 
temporal lobe epilepsy, or head trauma. And some people have synesthetic experiences, at least temporarily, by ingesting psychoactive drugs like LSD, mescaline, psilocybin, and ayahuasca. But recent studies have shown that these three different categories manifest in different ways. For example, developmental or genuine synesthesia occurs automatically and constantly, while acquired and drug-induced synesthesia do not occur automatically and only occurs some of the time, like when you're having an epileptic seizure or when you've just taken LSD. Similarly, developmental synesthesia doesn't change your physical senses. The synesthetic experiences are mental, and you know that. But drug-induced synesthesia can make you hallucinate things that you think you're seeing for real in your external environment. Also, developmental synesthesia doesn't require any special setting or state of consciousness, but acquired synesthesia frequently requires a darkened room and a drowsy state, and drug-induced synesthesia frequently needs a darkened room or low lighting and a hypnagogic or drowsy state, as well as having taken drugs, duh. Finally, the triggers and the concurrence are different for developmental synesthesia and the two other kinds. For example, with developmental or genuine synesthesia, seeing a visual trigger like a letter or number may result in a visual concurrent like a color, but this doesn't happen with acquired or drug-induced synesthesia. Similarly, some developmental synesthetes will hear a sound as the trigger and then they will experience a taste or a smell in response, but that also doesn't happen with acquired or drug-induced synesthesia. Conversely, people with drug-induced synesthesia may see something visual and will it will trigger a temperature sensation like feeling hot or cold, but that tends not to happen with developmental synesthesia. So there are differences between developmental synesthesia and the acquired and drug-induced kinds, meaning that they're different phenomena. And needless to say, developmental synesthetes don't show the proposed pathologies. They don't have brain lesions. They're not taking psychoactive drugs. I never use psychoactive drugs, but I have synesthesia all the time. And the developmental synesthetes are not mentally ill or hallucinating. They know that the synesthetic impressions they have are mental and not things they're actually seeing in the external world. In fact, contrary to the pathological theories, developmental synesthesia appears to confer advantages on some of the people who have it, which we'll discuss more in a bit. Then what about the idea that this is just a memory association thing? Like maybe you played with alphabet blocks or refrigerator magnets and you remember the colors. This is a more plausible hypothesis, and in favor of it, there is the fact that for grapheme color synesthetes, the colors do vary from one person to another, suggesting that this is a that there is an aspect of this phenomena that is learned. Because if it was hardwired, everyone would probably see the same colors with minimal variation. Uh, for example, in my own synesthesia, A, B, and C are red, orange, and yellow. That's like the color spectrum on a color wheel. And it's very likely that at some stage in my childhood, I learned to associate those letters with that part of the color spectrum. Similarly, when I was a kid, my favorite color was green. And it's no surprise that my name is dominantly green. I perhaps subconsciously or perhaps consciously decided that J and M are both green because it would make my name green. So there is an element of learning involved. Why then shouldn't this just be regarded as a form of memory association? First, because there are way more kinds of synesthesia than just grapheme color, and you can't explain other forms of synesthesia this way. It's not like I grew up with toys associating musical notes with changing shapes. I mean, today we have music visualizers that do that, but we didn't have music visualizers when I was a kid growing up in the 1960s and 70s. However, even with grapheme color synesthesia, it's more than simply a remembered association. Um, People have bad memories and their recall isn't consistent over time. So they've done tests where they taught non-synesthetes 
to associate certain letters and colors and then tested their recall at different time intervals, comparing them to grapheme color synesthetes like me. And it turns out that the grapheme color synesthetes scored much better on these tests than the non-synesthetes. They report uh, the color associations more quickly and more accurately than the non-synesthetes, indicating that something deeper than surface memory is what's happening here. And speaking from my own experience, the the experience doesn't feel like remembering. All I have to do is look at a word or hear it, and the colors appear instantly, faster than I can name them. Uh, it isn't like trying to remember one item after another. I see the colors all at once. So if someone says the word apple to me, I see red, pink, pink, blue, brown, all in a flash, faster than I can name it. Have other kinds of tests found a difference between synesthetes and non-synesthetes? Yes. Uh, for example, one test turns on the fact that digital twos are shaped a lot like digital fives. Basically, two and five look like mirror images of each other. And so uh, one test involves showing people a picture that looks like it's filled up with fives, but hidden among the fives, there is a triangle made out of twos. And what the the studies have shown is that the grapheme color synesthetes spot the hidden triangle of twos much faster than the non synesthetes, which happens for me. Uh, if I wave my eyes over the image, I quickly identify the hidden twos. So it's not like having to look at the image one character at a time and remember what color it's supposed to be. The color perceptions are more automatic than that, and they make synesthetes quicker at spotting the hidden shapes. Another test involves using your peripheral vision. Richard Cytoic explains, Established far less expensive tools than brain scans prove that synesthesia is automatic, involuntary, and perceptual. For example, if I ask you to focus straight ahead but project a digit in your peripheral vision, you can still make it out. But if I surround it with other digits, it then becomes invisible a phenomenon called masking. Synesthetes likewise fail to identify the masked digit, but they say things like, it must be seven because I see green. This implies that synesthesia occurs early in the chain of perception before we are even consciously aware of sensing anything. So here we have synesthetes being able to reason what the masked number must be based on its color, even though they're only seeing it out of their peripheral vision and it's surrounded by other digits to hide its identity. That's very different than looking straight at a digit and then remembering what color it's supposed to be. Here, you aren't looking at the digit at all. You're not consciously seeing its shape. And what your conscious mind is doing is reasoning what the digit must be based on the color that you're perceiving. That indicates that the color association is happening on a subconscious level. It's not something you're consciously doing. There's also another reason why synesthesia is different than just memorizing an association between two sensory modalities. People have tried teaching synesthesia to adults and failed. In his book, Synesthesia and Synesthetes, Sean Day writes, In 1934, E. Lowell Kelly attempted to teach colored hearing as a condition response. The experiment failed quite dismally, leading Kelly to conclude that true colored hearing synesthesia is a quite different thing than association, and that it may not be wholly produced via association. In 1944, T. H. Howells attempted the experimental development of color tone synesthesia, in which he tried to teach colored hearing. As with Kelly's experiment of 10 years before, Howells' experiment also met with little true success. So synesthesia seems to be something that manifests in childhood. Although there is a learning component to it, it's not something that you can just teach yourself, especially later in life. One of my favorite proofs that this isn't just childhood memory is based on the discovery of synesthesias in people who are colorblind or blind. Researchers have discovered a man who was colorblind and could not distinguish between blue and purple 
because he had a deficiency of S cones in his eyes. But his brain could still visualize colors, and they discovered that in his synesthesia, his brain was showing him colors that he could not physically see. He referred to them as his Martian colors because he'd never seen them in real life. And the fact that he'd never seen them shows that he couldn't have just memorized them in childhood. His Martian colors were being generated in the visual centers of his brain. And it turns out that the same thing happens with blind synesthetes. They also get synesthetic impressions of colors that they cannot see. So this is something rooted quite deeply in the brain and not just in the memory. I could go on and describe more tests that have been done that indicate synesthesia is more than just a conscious memory association, but you can read Richard Saitoic's book for more. If synesthesia is a real phenomenon and not just a conventional memory phenomenon or pathological condition, how common is it in society? This is unclear, and it depends partly on how you define synesthesia. Earlier, we heard that as many as 10% of the population may have some form of sp spatial sequence synesthesia, but only 4% of the population has the more clearly recognized forms of synesthesia. And this brings us to the idea that synesthesia may exist on a spectrum, with some people having really robust forms of it and other people having it, but to a lesser degree. There's actually good evidence to support this view. A classic example is known as the Buba Kiki effect, which was first documented in 1929. In experiments, researchers showed people two shapes. One was an irregular, spiky, star like shape, and the other looked similar, you know, like an irregular star, but with rounded edges rather than sharp points. The researchers then told test subjects that one of these shapes was named Kiki and the other was named Booba, and they asked them to guess which name went with which shape. Well, overwhelmingly people, 95% of them, said that the spiky star was Kiki and the rounded shape was Booba. And this has been verified in multiple countries with people of different cultures and different ages who speak different languages. You know, almost everybody says the spiky shape is Kiki and the rounded shape is Booba. And notice what they're doing here. They're associating a visual shape with a spoken sound. They're cross-connecting two different sensory domains. The shape is a visual trigger and the sound is an audible concurrent. This is a form of visual sound synesthesia, and it's one that everybody shares, suggesting that everybody has a form of low-level synesthesia. It's just more acute in some people than in others. And this is far from the only example of something like this. For example, uh, people talk about musical notes being high or low. Well, musical notes are audible, but high and low are spatial positions, suggesting a low-level, audible spatial synesthesia in the population at large. Similarly, people listen to each other's voices, and they may say that one person has a silky voice while another person has a rough voice. But silkiness and roughness are textures rather than sounds, suggesting a low-level audible texture synesthesia in the general population. We also have music that we describe as bright, like you'd hear in a comedy, or dark, like you'd hear in a horror movie, suggesting music shade synesthesia. People regularly talk about warm and cool colors, loud and muted colors, sharp tastes, and bitter cold. So cross-connecting descriptors like this appear all over the place. Conventionally, we would speak of descriptions like high and low notes, silky and rough voices, and bright and dark music as metaphors that we use to describe these things. But from another perspective, they all look like forms of synesthesia, suggesting that both suggesting both that there are multiple low-level synesthesias in the general population, and that synesthesia, or cross-connecting different domains, is at the root 
of our ability to use conceptual and linguistic metaphors. In other words, we may have metaphors because we all have forms of low-level synesthesia that we're not normally conscious of. If everybody has a low-level form of synesthesia, what causes it to develop more acutely in some individuals? We're not sure. Uh, This is currently an area being researched. Two of the most common theories are that it either involves increased connectivity between different regions of the brain, or that it involves a decreased level of inhibition in parts of the brain talking to each other. The increased connectivity idea proposes that when we're young, the brains of synesthetes grow extra neural connections between different areas in the brain, leading them to cross-connect things like visual shapes or music and colors. Richard Saitoic explains, Favoring increased connectivity is the fact that the fetal brain creates two million structural synapses a second. This leaves newborns with an excess of working connections among assorted brain areas that are then pruned away in response to an individual's unique experience. It's suggested that all neonates are synesthetic, only to lose the trait around the age of three months. One possibility for why the crosstalk that produces synesthesia exists is that the normally occurring excess connections are insufficiently pruned for some reason and accordingly persist in the adult. But there are challenges to this idea. A problem with the increased wiring hypothesis is that we should expect to see synesthesia present from birth onward, but we don't. The trait does not become evident until mid-childhood. Grapheme-related synesthesia appears only after age 3, and emotionally-mediated synesthesia between the ages of 3 and 5. Then there's the disinhibition idea. It proposes that instead of synesthetes having more cross-connections in their brains, they have different levels of inhibition in the parts of their brains talking to each other. In most people, uh, one part of the brain does its job, and it's inhibited from talking to other parts of the brain, or at least most other parts. But in synesthetes, this proposal says, there are various lacks of inhibition that result in one brain part talking to others in a way that most people's brains don't. Back to Cytoic. The second possibility imagines faulty inhibition as synesthesia's root cause. It presumes that in the normal brain, excitation and inhibition are balanced, whereas in synesthetic ones, excitation overcomes inhibition that is innately weak. This framework acknowledges the rich connectivity present in all brains, and it sees the difference between normal and synesthetic brains as one of inhibitory degree. The structure being disinhibited may be nearby or remote. What matters isn't proximity, but rather that connections exist between two given entities. And there's some evidence in favor of this view. Favoring the disinhibition hypothesis is the observation that non-synesthetes occasionally have synesthetic experiences during states of meditation, deep absorption, sensory deprivation, or while drugged or falling asleep. So maybe in these states, the brains of people who don't normally experience synesthesia become disinhibited. The different regions of the brain start talking to each other, and they have acquired or drug-induced synesthetic experiences rather than developmental ones. However, the evidence is currently unclear. Cytoic says, It is currently impossible to decide between these two hypotheses because a change in either connectivity or neurotransmission physiology could produce a change in the other variable. While early studies with diffusion tensor imaging appear to support the speculation of increased anatomical connections, it is equally possible that the denser connections observed via tensor imaging are a result of, or secondary to, imbalances among neurotransmitters. And he says... No mechanism ultimately gets to why, nor is it likely to, in the fundamental sense that everyone is hoping for. Asking why some people are synesthetic while others are not is no different than asking why some people and not others have migraines, epilepsy, or anything else. However, there are some clues about why some people may develop synesthesia. You'll recall that as unborn children, our brains make up to 2 million synapses per second. 
our brains continue to grow at a rapid rate in the first few years after birth. But then our brains start pruning away many of these connections, which is part of why of what's responsible for early childhood amnesia, you know, which is something we all have. So how might that relate to synesthesia? Well, our brains tend to hang on to neural pathways that we use often. It, again, it's a use it or lose it thing. Like if you don't regularly refresh a memory, you're likely to forget it over time. Now, notice that a lot of the things that people have synesthesia for are learned sequences, like the alphabet or the numbers. A, B, C, and 1, 2, 3 have to be memorized in early childhood. Also, things like days of the week and the months of the year are common synesthetic triggers, and months and days have to be memorized too. So what happens if you're a child, like me, with a learning disability? I've mentioned before on the show that I have dyslexia, and so it was difficult for me to learn to read. Uh, personally, I remember liking my first grade teacher, but my mom did not like her because my mom remembered me coming home in tears after my teacher had been cruel to me for making spelling mistakes. So my parents took me for testing, which showed I was dyslexic. They put me on a machine called a Reader Hoffman that used records and film strips to read to me out loud while showing me pictures and written text. And by the time I was in fifth grade, I was reading at an eighth grade level. So all the practice I did reinforced the neural pathways I had connected with reading and the alphabet and stopped them from being pruned away. Or maybe all the practice I did disinhibited the letter recognition areas of my brain from talking to the color recognition areas. Either way, maybe the fact I had to struggle to learn to read well is why I have this form of synesthesia. Maybe I have grapheme color synesthesia because I'm dyslexic. Instead of my dyslexia keeping me from reading letters, I ended up with colored letters as a result of all the practice I did. That makes a good pivot point to why dyslexia exists. What can you say about that? The widespread basis of low-level synesthesia in the general population suggests that it's playing an important function for us, even if we're not aware of it. It suggests that there is evolutionary selection pressure keeping the genes in the gene pool, otherwise they'd erode away over the generations. And the fact that synesthesia seems connected with metaphor, like loud ties and sharp cheese, is likely a good reason why. Metaphors are important conceptual and linguistic tools, and they have immeasurably enriched human experience by allowing us to perceive and talk about similarities between things in different realms. Metaphors also allow us to solve problems by using information we've learned about one subject and metaphorically applying it to a different subject. So synesthesia may exist because it plays an important role in human intelligence. And this may be why some individuals experience it in a more dramatic way. While some synesthetes occasionally find their experiences overwhelming, most synesthetes are very glad that they have the condition and think that it improves and enriches their experience of life. They say that they would miss it if they didn't have it, and that's certainly true for me. I'm glad I have the forms I do. Synesthesia also may help individuals who have the more dramatic forms in concrete ways. For years, uh, people have told me that they seem to think I have a really good memory, and eventually I began to suspect that one thing that may be playing a role in that is my synesthesia. I thought maybe the colors that I see for letters and numbers are making it easier for me to remember words and numbers. I mean, I haven't traditionally paid attention to the colors most of the time, but they're there in my head, either consciously or subconsciously, and maybe the extra visual memory of the colors helps me remember words and numbers. And indeed, synesthetes are reported to have better memories. Sometimes I use the colors to remember things by deliberately paying attention to them. For example, back when I was writing episode 243 on giants, including giants in the Bible, I needed to remember the verse Numbers 1334, which is about biblical giants. Well, uh, the abbreviation for the book of Numbers, N-U-M, 
is yellow with undertones of green and blue. And 1334 is white, purple, purple, seafoam, green. And I really like that because three and four have my favorite colors among the numbers. So as I was transitioning from one computer application to another and needing to remember this verse, I remembered the color sequence. And then I had no trouble remembering, oh, numbers 1334, even though I was moving quickly between applications and writing fast. However, we shouldn't overestimate the effect that synesthesia has on memory. Sean Day writes, Colored grapheme synesthesia can bestow a slight but discernible general advantage to memory for non-synesthesia-inducing items in young synesthetes compared to adult non-synesthetes. The difference is perhaps too subtle to discern between young grapheme to color synesthetes and young non-synesthetes only emerging and becoming more apparent with age. Grapheme to color synesthetes also have an enhanced capability of associative memory for the color of non-graphene items, but not for their shapes or locations. So grapheme color synesthesia provides some memory advantage, especially in adulthood, but it's not a massive difference. In any event, my grapheme color synesthesia helps me as a writer, and I've noticed that a lot of famous musicians have strong music visual synesthesia, so maybe that's helping them with their craft. Also, the grid that I project onto the floor and the geometrical shapes that I see in my head when I think about choreography make it much easier for me to dance and to function as a choreographer. So there are benefits there also. Helping out with tasks like memory, writing, music, and dance. That's cool. But now let's get to what some listeners will really want to know about. Is there a relationship between synesthesia and psychic functioning? Anecdotally, yes. Uh, You can make up your own mind about whether you think psychic functioning is real, but it's been reported for some time that some of the best remote viewers are also synesthetes. And back in episode 198, I was interviewing physicist and psychic researcher Dr. Edwin May, and this exchange occurred. One thing that I read in uh, your paper on uh, the multiphasic model of precognition is that there may be, and this was more hypothetical, it wasn't proposed as this is definite, but that there could be some kind of association of psychic functioning with a form of hyperconnectivity in the brain where different things in the brain are correlated in an abnormal way. And you mentioned that several of the remote uh, viewing black belts that you worked with had uh, what's known as synesthesia, which is the association of different types of sensory modalities with each other. So, for example, uh, a lot the most common kind of synesthesia is called grapheme color synesthesia. A grapheme is something you write like a letter or a number. And then people who have this kind of synesthesia will associate letters and numbers with colors. And some some of our subjects, all of them were (laughs) all of the. Oh, really? Interesting. Okay. So, and then there are other kinds of synesthesia as well. Um, So do you, at this point, do you think that that is a significant indicator of possible ability? Stay tuned. Um, We have, uh, there are a number of testable hypotheses in that model. And I'm working with some neuroscientists who are committed to test those hypotheses. We can actually get a quantitative measure of hyperconnectivity in the brain. So not just some of the best remote viewers Dr. May has worked with, or black belts as they're called, are synesthetes, all of the black belts are synesthetes, suggesting that synesthesia may be correlated with high levels of psychic functioning. And Dr. May is currently doing neurological research to try to see whether synesthesia and hyperconnectivity in the brain are really associated with better psychic abilities. Did Dr. Cytoic have anything to say about this subject in his book on synesthesia? Actually, yes. Unlike Dr. May, Dr. Cytoic does not appear to believe in psychic phenomena, at least from what he says, but he does note that people report psychic experiences in connection with some brain phenomena, such as seizures from temporal lobe epilepsy. 
and he thinks that synesthesia may explain at least one reported psychic phenomenon. And what's that? Auras. For a long time, people have reported seeing colored fields around other human beings, and these fields are known as auras. People with one kind of personality or who are in one mood will have one color or group of colors in their in the auras surrounding their bodies, while people with other personalities or in other moods will have other colors. And people who read auras claim to be able to see these colors and even diagnose things about the person based on their aura. But if auras exist and people can see them, that should be testable. Like, for example, putting a person behind a screen that is as tall as they are and seeing if an aura reader can tell whether or not a person is behind the screen by seeing their aura radiating above the screen and, you know, where their head is. If the aura reader can tell that a person is behind the screen by their protruding aura, that would be evidence in favor of auras. But if they can't tell whether a person is behind the screen, that would be evidence against auras. We were talking about this in one of my classes at the Rhine Institute, and the executive director of the Rhine Institute, uh, John Kruth, who I episode, who I interviewed in episode 260 on the 21st Century Poltergeist, he indicated that experiments on this subject had turned up negative results. The aura readers could not tell whether a person was or wasn't behind a screen based on their aura protruding above the screen, which would be evidence against the existence or at least the perceivability of auras. Now, back when I was a new ager in my teenage years, I had tried my hand at aura reading, and it seemed to me that I did associate certain colors with certain people. So I knew aura readers weren't just you know, lying or making up their claims to perceive auras. And in class, a solution immediately occurred to me. Maybe this is a form of synesthesia. Maybe aura readers aren't actually seeing an aura radiating from a person, like I don't see red physically radiating from an A. Um, Maybe they're subconsciously picking up clues about a person's mood or personality, and they're synesthetically translating that experience into color perceptions, in which case aura reading would be a kind of personality color synesthesia or mood color synesthesia. And here's what Seidowick proposes in his book. He writes, The claim that certain gifted individuals see colored auras has had a long place in folk psychology Although the bulk of people claiming such powers are either deluded or charlatans, it is possible that some are undiagnosed synesthetes. Rather than assume that people radiate a mysterious energy that only psychics can detect, a realistic account need not only acknowledge that individuals regularly elicit an emotional response in others, and then assume that a synesthetic cross-activation between brain structures involved in emotion and color perception enables an emotion-inducing stimulus to take on the novel aspect of a colored aura. This is also suggested by the statistics at Sean Day's website, which indicates that about 6.5% of people with synesthesia perceive auras in which they associate colors with personalities. As with everything concerning psychic research, of course, this claim is controversial, with some skeptics talking down the possibility, but there the needed kinds of studies haven't been done, so it may turn out that aura perception is really a form of synesthesia. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on this topic? Synesthesia is a fascinating phenomenon. It takes at least 150 forms, the most common of which include associating letters and numbers with colors, associating music with colors and shapes, and laying out numbers and calendars around you in space. There is a learned aspect to synesthesia, but it's rooted in the brain and significantly operates on a subconscious or preconscious level. And it runs in families, so it has a genetic component. The more dramatic kinds of synesthesia are experienced by about 4% of the population, but it appears there is a form of low-grade synesthesia 
in the general population, and this may be the basis for the human ability to use metaphors and compare things of different classes. Normally, developmental synesthesia is not a pathological condition. In fact, it appears to confer benefits on people who have it. They generally enjoy the experience, and it may help them have better memories somewhat. Those things are certainly true in my case. People may develop synesthesia when they face particular learning challenges. Uh, It may be caused by extra connectivity between parts of the brain or by the parts of the brain, brain being disinhibited from talking to each other. Synesthesia may be the actual explanation for the reported paranormal ability to see auras, and it may be correlated with higher levels of psychic functioning in things like precognition or remote viewing, depending on what you think about such things. And Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners and viewers? We'll have links to Richard Saitoic's book, Synesthesia, also Sean Day's book, Synesthesia and Synesthetes, Sean Day's uh, Synesthesia website, also a synesthesia battery, a test that you can take, also general information about synesthesia and its history, the different types of it, ideasthesia, color organs, Francis Galton's 1880 article on visualized numerals. We'll also have a link to my synesthetic alphabet and numbers. Also uh, links to Kuana Suigo Fireworks Festival from 2017, which we used some video from. Ray Lynch's song, Celestial Soda Pop. The Booba Kiki Effect. uh, And a couple of videos, one by Tom Scott and one by Mindful Thinks on uh, Kiki and Booba, as well as information on auras. Excellent. So that's it from us this time. What are your theories about synesthesia? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, uh, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619 738 Four five one five. That's six one nine seven three eight four five one five. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio Seven for the video and animation work in this episode, which was extra special because they had to do that animation of what I see when I listen to Celestial Soda Pop. So if you want to have an experience of what it's like for me to listen to instrumental music, at least in some cases, uh, be sure to go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, and check out this week's video where you can watch that representation of what it's like. It's It's not exactly what I see, but it's a good representation. So check that out. And while you're there, Um, You can support the channel by liking, commenting, and subscribing, because if you engage with the channel, that tells YouTube's algorithm that you found the channel engaging, and that other people might find it engaging too, so it'll show it to more people and you can help it out by liking, commenting, and subscribing. And when you subscribe, you know, I am trying to grow my channel, so I'd appreciate it if you did subscribe, and if you hit the bell notification, you can always get a notification whenever I have a new video. I usually have a few a week now, um, whether the video is Mysterious World or something else. Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Christmas is coming up, so next week we're going to be talking about a religious mystery discussing Jesus. We're going to be looking specifically at the subject of Jesus's tomb. There is a controversy about where and even whether Jesus was buried. And so we'll be revealing what the evidence says about the location of the actual site and how we know this. And be sure to check out the Mysterious World bookstore at mysteriousworldstore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in the show. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 288. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by... 
Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com and by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at gradygroupinc.com. And by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs Matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. Until next time, Jimmy Yakin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World on StarQuest.